Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Charles Dickens is a writer that needs little introduction. In fact, I've already covered his famous novella, A Christmas Carol, on the podcast previously. But he is one of the premier craftsmen of English literature throughout the world. And he always will be. So much so that there is nothing I, or anyone else for that matter, could say to take that away from him. His reputation and place in the canon is all but cemented. But today, we go into one of his classic novels, A Tale of Two Cities. This novel, originally published in 1859, and as was usually the case with novels in those days, it was serialized over the course of several issues before it was published in the novel form that we all know and love today. Dickens' reputation for being a witty writer and performance artist is all well known and documented. He is a legend of the literary arts. I won't belabor the point, listeners. This book started out rough for me. Very rough. Maybe it was my mood or temperament. But it hasn't set well with me since I began reading it. The famous first line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, is of course a timeless first line for a novel. But my hopes died very quickly after that. This particular book drags, dear listeners, drags on and on in a way I wasn't expecting for Dickens. His best works are usually so quick and witty and to the point that this particular novel seemed like a lost novel in his body of work. Something that didn't quite work as well as his many masterpieces do. The main problem being the story just isn't very good. The jokes just aren't very good. But in so much of Dickens' work, those two aspects are front and center. Marvelous stories, witty jokes that hold up over a hundred years later. But in A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens seems almost lost, preoccupied. I don't want to speculate about his divorce, etc., his personal turmoils that were going on in his life at the time of composing this. But I will go as far as to say, it feels like a lost book. Like it was aiming to be one thing and never got close to the target or what was aimed for. The first book, as it is divided into three books in total, was an absolute drag, as I said, a slog to get through. I was so disappointed with the tone and mild cheekiness of the story that I found myself checking my watch, checking the number of pages left in the chapter, wondering how much longer it would take me to make my way through its pages. Something I wasn't expecting, being an avid Dickens fan. It isn't until book three that the story even begins to come together, but by that point, there have already been 200 pages of story. But of course, the prison escape is the best part. It just takes so long to get there. And this in no way dismisses Dickens' accomplishments. I'll be the first to admit, when writing about historical events, it is often difficult to make it interesting or fresh. Of course, Dickens knew this as well, and wasted very little time on such historical happenings as revolutions. But there are chapters full of some of these events 
the third book occupied entirely by them. And I found myself unusually bored by Dickens' prose in this particular book. The characters are many, but concentrated mainly in London and Paris. Paris only coming up here and there until we get to the end of the second book and then into the third book. Only a few characters to be known in the French city, and that's all fine and well, but there seems to be a lack of that something Dickens always manages to capture in all his works. That entertainment factor that he used so well with winding stories and elaborate plots that are still remembered well past his death. Movies still made of them. Plays still performed. Musical adaptations still listened to. But A Tale of Two Cities is not that. It strikes me as the weakest thing I've read by Dickens. That isn't to say it doesn't have its moments. Sure, there are interesting scenes. The doctor forgetting his memories and becoming a shoemaker in his bedroom had echoes of the classic Dickens I've come to know through reading only a few of his books. And I do plan on reading all of his works eventually, dear listeners perhaps on this very podcast. But A Tale of Two Cities suffers from a complexity without movement, if I had to call it anything. There is more unseen in the novel than seen. And no, it isn't because we jump back and forth between the two cities and the characters within them. It just feels a little empty. Like this novel was composed without that gut feeling driving it. That drive that comes through in the great works of literature. Even the love story seems so boring and unusually subtle, only mattering when we come to the final section of the novel, the third book. And I couldn't help but feel that that part of the story, the tragedy between the lovers was unearned as I was reading it. We barely see interactions with the pair in love, the wedding, etc. And then we, as readers, are expected to have some sort of agony as the pair is separated by the revolutionaries in Paris. It just felt off to me. A little too expectant of the reader. Not expected, but expectant, listeners. And not that a novel that covers this much ground needs to show such things in detail, but I have to say, listeners, I just expected more from a master like Dickens. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe my expectations were too high, or rather, too great, pun intended. But what good are expectations about one of the greatest masters of the craft if they aren't the highest bar ever set for novel writing? And none of this is to say that this novel is bad, listeners, merely that it is perhaps Dickens' weakest novel. But to avoid confusion and not belabor the point, I feel I should explain the act of judging a work of art. And so I take this opportunity to talk about judgment and why it's important. Maybe even the most important aspect of receiving and appreciating works of art. That's right, judgment. Judging something based on how you feel about it. I've long stressed this, as regular listeners to the podcast will know. But I haven't gone into much detail about it. What you as a reader, observer, whatever, feel when reading, observing, etc., is the most important part. I'm not interested in what a textbook written by a dead, usually middle-aged scholar, said a hundred years ago, or two hundred years ago, or even fifty years ago. I'm not interested in what someone other than myself claims I should be feeling or taking away from a work of art. What matters is how you, the person witnessing this work of art, feel. How I, the person witnessing this work of art, feel. 
What most are referring to when asking about taste is this. Do you trust your gut, your instincts, your love of craftsmanship? Do you? Because this is required for making such a judgment, as I have with this classic novel. And no, it isn't about being lazy or boredom, necessarily. It is about that feeling within you that is evoked from the work of art. And that isn't to say that technical aspects can be overlooked by the less educated on the craft. Of course they can. But still, the less educated observer who trusts their gut and instincts based on what they just read or watched or saw or observed is far better a critic than someone who relies entirely on textbooks and what they insist about craftsmanship. And I fear we are living through a new dark age in this world of criticism. That because anyone can put their judgments of a work of art online at any time, we are all now critics, diminishing the role. But by definition, if we are all critics, then no one is. And I take issue with that. Because it seems we are losing our judgment, our taste. We see many formerly serious magazines and publications devolve into the current political hysterias of the day and call it judgment. Pretending that measuring how well a work of art adheres to their given political priors things they read in a book, is equivalent to actual art criticism, usually invoking some political topic that was created out of thin air five years ago, or even five seconds ago, and claiming the work insufficiently adheres to that made-up political principle. See everything written about John Berryman's dream songs in the last five years, listeners, if you're skeptical. But what I want to stress to listeners here is that a judgment that involves a political principle or any principle that doesn't have to do with artistic craftsmanship is not a real and serious judgment. It is a flawed hyperfixation. Something that clouds out clear thinking, the art of the thrill, the art of reason and logic even. A judgment that is relying on the political trends of the day to instruct how one should feel about a work of art, the fashions, political or otherwise, proffered to be guiding their false judgment, instead of the feeling evoked from within themselves, is simply plagiarizing a textbook, an appeal to a false authority, a false moral authority, even in this current age of hyper-political hysteria. This is my battleground, listeners. This is a stance I make repeatedly, that I do not trust anyone not trusting their own gut or instinct or knowledge. I don't trust any artistic judgment that outsources their feeling on a work of art to a political focus group that hands back a list of rules to adhere to. This brings us to what I call taste, this thing that is required to make such a judgment in the first place. This taste is the most valuable thing about this work of a critic. And when one isn't stern or is too wishy-washy in their initial judgments, it means they aren't trusting themselves and how they feel about a work of art like this. I am not someone who wishes to criticize great works of art or the artists who make these pieces just for the sake of political trends or to fit in with a crowd or to repeat something I read out of a textbook because I think it's cool. No, no, no. I speak only from what I feel, what is evoked in me from the work of art, along with my expectations, and, of course, lastly, my education. 
What many fail to understand when I criticize a work like Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities is the confusion of my taste with this amateur impulse to tear down or belittle the great craftsmanship that came before me. Nothing could be further from the truth. And no, it isn't because the work is old or dated. These are easy excuses made by weak minds to dismiss greatness. But what should be understood about a criticism of a classic novel like this is how well it evokes these feelings of fire within me, sparking and latching on to the human desires and needs and expressions within all of us. And no, I'm not saying all books must be universal to everything and anything, but that this judgment is formed from only myself. I purposefully don't read any criticism or received interpretation or knowledge from dead scholars, even from living ones. I simply don't care what they have to say. I care about what I feel, what the work of art makes me feel, what it makes me think about, what I got from the work of art, not what I was told to think about or take from said works. This allows me to stand by my judgments without wavering, to be willing to be laughed out of rooms for not repeating the received mantras so often clung to for authority, to not be dismayed by nerds who only long to be teacher's pets and get A's in school on their little essay projects. No, no, no. This is much bigger than that. Dear listeners, I don't take anyone's word for it, especially when it comes to literature and art, subjects that are so much unlike the other fields of study. This isn't biology, where there is a fact that must that one must memorize. This is malleable. This is something fragile, even. Something that can be completely destroyed or phoenixed from ashes, based on one person's judgment. Melville's Moby Dick comes to mind, a book that was tossed aside by those who worship textbooks and the scholars who write them, only to be revived by a few others years later. A single person, even, who feels some fire from within as they read a book or witness a work of art in some way, can forever change the perception of how it is read by lazy laymen who repeat takes they've read out of textbooks, often a smug smile on their face as they recite the alphabet, expecting that grade, a big letter A, to be stamped at the top of their paper. No, no, no. This sort of judgment, the kind I am talking about, is for those who trust themselves and their own readings and interpretations. Textbook plagiarists are a dime a dozen in this field and can be dismissed as easily as they copy the words from another. Boring the world to death with their little biographical obsessions. I hope I'm making sense in this way, dear listeners. And this is not to build myself up either, but merely to state, it is obvious when someone is making an honest judgment about a work of art, and when they are repeating the expected framework, usually politically motivated in this year of 2024, where the author's voting record, the author's feelings on economics, the author's skin color, the author's sexual orientation, the author's fake authority to write something or not, are all invoked constantly as a form of judgment. But notice that it's everything but the work of art on the page that's used to make those childish little things called judgments. Everything but the art right in front of them. This type of criticism is what I've termed received criticism. Words and phrases that can be repeated so unthinkingly as to be meaningless. People with so little trust in their own judgment that they need to ask permission from the political overlords of the day. 
peeking over a blockade to ensure their impressions are suitable to the ruling ideologies. The trends. I think many of you come here to this podcast because you are not interested in those things. The many repeated ideas and judgments that can be seen on any social media timeline at any given time. Endlessly repeating the same takes over and over again, like little seals at a circus, waiting for fish to be thrown into their mouths for performing the trick. Repeating received forms of judgment are a disgrace to the many fields of art and art making. So I stand before you here, hopefully making it clear that I am not making any of my judgments on Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities without this consideration, without the slight doubt of my misinterpretation, but only referencing what I feel about it what I got out of the words on the page in front of me. The year they were written does not matter. The author, one of the luminaries of the English language, does not matter. It is my judgment I write about, my feelings evoked from the pages before me. And if a critic or anyone else ever tries to invoke anything other than that, When making such a judgment, just know that it can be easily dismissed because it was not based on the things that matter when evaluating art and its merits, but something they read in a book, or worse, read and repeated from a social media timeline. Heavy. Bored. Fuck, all right. Well, it's been a rough few weeks for me here. I haven't been keeping up with this, but whew, all right. Welcome to another episode of Heavy Board. Uh, and today I am talking about A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Those of you that have heard the monologue, I'll admit right away, I really don't have much to say about this book. Um, I wasn't thrilled by it. I really was disappointed by it more than anything else, which I wasn't expecting from something like Charles Dickens. I just found it bloated. I found it a little long. I found it a little, oh my, like, are we seriously, I guess we're doing this, right? It just, it seemed a little directionless for a while. And then of course it starts to make more sense when you get into book three. Uh, and all that good stuff, but by the time I got to book three, it just, it just like, all right, well, I've already spent like over 200 pages reading this, and then I get into book three when it actually, like, the action starts, and we have the actual kind of drama unfolding, <sighs> and I was just like, all right, well, it's too late, man. Like, it felt a little unearned, like I said. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board to get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you for less than one cup of coffee per month you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content subscribers only ama episodes bonus extended interviews and more come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board